chambers. Oh, it's getting too hot. I gotta fix that breach chamber. Hope everyone enjoyed that bit of fun there. After a few discussions with my dad, we were starting to feel pretty down about Digby's engine. But we did decide that we should put a new pre-chamber into number five for educational purposes. So I decided to go out to the farm when I had some extra time and get a new pre-chamber put into number five. Even without my dad there, I still remembered most of the steps on how to put the pre-chamber back in. So it was a fun morning getting to work on the car. Okay, we got Digby put back together. I'm gonna have Jerson help me push it outside so I can try to start it. Okay, Let's pull it up and see what happens. Oh, there you go. After two failed attempts of trying to start Digby, Jerson started yelling at me and reminded me of something. Anytime you work with the fuel lines, you need to purge the fuel system. So I hopped back out of the car, grabbed a wrench, loosened up the fuel lines, and went back and forth cranking it over and checking the lines to making sure that I have enough fuel running through the system for the car to start. Only this one has a little bit. Okay, so keep cranking. After doing this a few times, we had fuel running through the system, and now it's time to start Digby. Now it should start up. Okay guys, so this is the first on-road test since we've changed out both pre-chambers. I'm going to try to clear out this excess fuel. favorites. 
spot ever to try to pull out with the diesel Mercedes. Acceleration. The first time I got it out, so I'm hoping that this is going to clear up a bit after we run it. Let's go straight. amazing how much smoother and uh, more power it is even just on this short drive. Yeah. Alright, let's go talk to my dad about the prognosis. Alright, found my dad. He's been uh, tinkering around with this 126. Dad, what are you working on right now? Well, I'm working on the front suspension. We got some loose brake control rod joints very typical of what you see on these w126s so i'm going to remove this i'm actually shooting an instructional video to show somebody how they can replace these themselves all right so we took digby on our official test drive after now fixing pre-chamber number five yeah and i came out earlier this morning i was listening you know okay so one of the things we've noticed is it has more power it does sound noticeably better but there's still smoke yeah. and after you had mentioned we had talked off camera last time is we're really concerned about the long-term damage that this had done so it's sounding like we're thinking of the option of going with a transplant but why are you so concerned of the damage mainly number one if i were going to just putz around in that car i could leave it that way but i am concerned about the smoke just because it's, it's very annoying particularly if you sit at idle at a stop light too long and you're gonna have smoke pouring out the back. So we could go after the smoke. We could do things like rebuild the injectors. We tested the injectors, they were kind of spraying okay, but we could rebuild the injectors. We could check engine timing and particularly injection pump timing. We could keep doing this and doing this, trying to get it better. But after finding two blown pre-chambers and damage down in the cylinders, I think it's time to say goodbye to that engine. So what do you think were some of the causes? Because we had mentioned some ideas yeah. off camera, but what do you think some of the causes to cause two pre-chambers to do that? I, st you know, my gut feeling, because I've seen this happen a number of times with people, my gut feeling is somebody put gasoline in that fuel tank and ran it a while. You know, ran it a few hundred miles with gasoline, parked gasoline in the tank, and got those combustion uh, temperatures so high that it really did fatigue and crystallize those pre-chambers. I, I don't think anything other than extreme heat could have caused the damage we saw. So one cool thing, Dad, we get to do though by taking Digby's engine out is we actually get to tear it all apart and look to see where all the damage and what might have happened in the engine. Where are you hoping to find some things and some clues once we get to that part of the project? Something really interesting happened this past week, Joel, is we had a customer send some pictures of the damage to their engines, very similar damage, and he showed what could happen to the valves. So I suspect when we take Digby's engine apart and we pull the cylinder head off, we're gonna get a real clear picture of all that collateral damage and maybe we'll even pull the turbocharger apart so people can see that as well so if you want you know take take the camera out there and show people just how good this engine sounds when you fire it up let's go look look at 
battery. dad this is our potential digby transplant tell us a little bit about this car well if you followed my videos you know that i picked this car up a number of months ago along with two other 300 sds they were all 1981 300 sds now the sd designation means it's a super class so it's bigger more luxurious than digby over there but look at the engine the engine's the same it's got a 617 turbo diesel five-cylinder engine just like Digby but the interesting thing when I bought this car is the guy had all these meticulous records of his oil changes every 3,000 miles he had this booklet and he kept showing me every 3,000 miles he changed the engine oil there were some other things wrong with the car <laughs> but he took care of this engine and when I drove it you know that first time I had that massaging problem it was a problem with the turbo overboost and once we fixed this suddenly this thing you know took off like a rocket and when you start it I'm gonna start it up here in a second and I think you viewers can see just by the way this engine starts has really strong bark to it What are some of the differences between this engine and Digby's? Okay, even though the engine's the same, there's some very subtle differences. Number one, the motor mounts are different. So you, we're gonna have to swap motor mounts. The oil cooler hoses are different. Some of the throttle linkages are different. So it's not gonna require much, but it's kind of nice to have both engines side by side. And, and we'll show this when we get the engines out. We'll put them side by side and we'll start swapping parts and also we're gonna change anything that might be a problem in the future. But Joel, one thing, we're not ready to make this swap until you do something. You know what that is? It's a compression test. That's one thing I've never done on the massager here. I've never done a compression test. So just to be safe, we're gonna pull those injectors out and you're gonna to get to do the compression test this morning before we start pulling the engine. So one thing we're gonna do with this transplant that is unusual for this shop is, since most of you that would ever take on this endeavor don't have a lift, we're gonna do this whole thing on the ground using ramps. So I'm gonna regret that later, but we're gonna film everything from the ground. Ingenuity, right? Okay, that's straight. Tire uh, straight. Yeah. We on the ramp? Yep. Okay, hands clear. You're getting ready to pull the radiator out. Okay. Um, we cannot remove the engine with the fan on the engine. It yeah. will not clear the core support. Okay. So we've got to be able to tilt the engine up like this and out over the top. Gotcha. The core support does not come apart here. So we can leave the AC condenser in here, mm -hmm. but the radiator's got to, the radiator's got to come out, fan shroud. And so what you're doing there is you're getting it on the checklist. It's called pull fan, pull fan shroud, pull radiator. So we'll have to get ready to drain the radiator here when... Okay. Rolling. Hey Dad, can you come here and look at something? When I was taking off this fuel line, this part was actually loose. So I had to use the 15 to hold this while getting that. And then now I'm trying to get out the injector. Oh, great. And that's... <laughs> All right, let me get you the long breaker bar. You want to make sure not to over torque your fuel injectors because it can cause damage. Do that hurt? Uh, I'm getting better at not hitting the <laughs> as much. Some interesting scarring on this injector. 
gonna wipe it away and see if there's any. Go ahead, Ryan. Okay. 350. All right. <laughs> you. Ah, we got her. All right, Dad. Compression looks good. What do we do next? Well, now the fun begins for you and your buddy, all right? Because we're going to pull this engine. I'm convinced we've got a good engine here. And what I've done, Joel, is I've worked up a checklist. I've had this for a long time, but this is a step-by-step -step checklist on the steps you have to go through to remove one of these older diesel engines. You do not want to get the lift hooked up to it and have things still hooked up while you're trying to remove the engine from the engine compartment. So I'm going to give you this list. You're going to follow it. We're going to get the car completely up in the air. We're going to have four ramps under all four wheels and you're going to get underneath because that's what you start on. You start on disconnecting everything underneath and we'll go from there. Strap and starter bolt. Is that right? 